Hey there, and welcome to the daily podcast where wisdom smacks us with kisses or love taps. I'm Michelle Spiva, a wisdom strengthening coach, your host, and practical priestess of wisdom. Join us daily to gain wisdom and mental strength as we tackle innovative thinking, address emotional and behavioral life traps, and yes, provide you with some practical how-tos to wrap it all up. So settle in or crank up the speed 2x, whatever gets your mental processes firing as we dive in. Stay tuned. Hey, this is Michelle Spivey, your Practical Priestess of Wisdom, and I want to welcome you to today's podcast of Wisdom Smack. So what I'm going to be doing is I am going to be addressing some of the feedback I've gotten from one of the most popular uh, podcasts that we've had so far, and that is on how to concentrate. But today we're going to be taking it a step further to help you to learn how to find your focus and concentration. And so what I'd like you to do is stick with me on the flip as we get into looking at ways to identify and and to work with how to build in you the ability to lock in on your focus, lock in on that concentration, how to get into your zone, and how to actually succeed at it. I'll see you on the flip. All right, let's get to it. Thank you so much for joining me on the flip to get into learning how to find, lock in on that focus and concentration that we all need and desire to have in order to accomplish things, to find our way, to meet our purpose and the like. All right, so um, what I'm going to tell you right quick is that a lot of um, how I'm going to be presenting this today is kind of how I go about creating a fictional character and getting to the nitty gritty of how to get them moving and active and giving them a purpose and a why. And so I'm going to be talking to you about that. And then we're going to finish up with some shortcuts to success. And, you know, we can't do a lot in our little uh, half hour time that we talk, but what we can do is give you points of inspiration that hopefully will get, uh, give you the jumping board um, to get started on your own personal motivation. So let's get to it. All right. So the first thing I'm going to say is one of the obvious ways that people use to be able to start finding and honing in on their focus and their concentration is positive and negative pressure to perform. Uh, Deadlines. People love to use deadlines. And depending on who's controlling the deadline, it can be advantageous or it can be disastrous for you. There are some people that they wait to the last minute when it has to be done for them to be able to lock in and do what they need to do. And then at other times, these same people, mind you, that use this can't seem for the life of them make themselves meet that deadline. And it doesn't matter how big of a high stake, because we're going to talk about that in a minute, that is looming, they just can't seem to do it. And so we'll, like I said, we'll be talking a little bit about some of those things uh, with regards to how to find what it is. And uh, we'll be talking about tendencies and and the like uh, to help you get um, a, a lot of different points that you can hit on to drill down to what gets you motivated to do what it is you need to do. So before we move any further, let me just do a, a brief little scope of what we're focusing on. You see how I use that word when we're talking about this concentration. So the focus and concentration that we're talking about today is that state that mental, emotional, physical state that you enter into to be able to um, exclude all external uh, stimuli, impulses, and the like to finish or to work on something and work on it in a way that you are the most effective and efficient at what you're doing. Okay, so when we're talking about focus and and concentration, we're talking about that good old getting in the zone and being able to create, being able to produce, to complete and to do all the things that it is that you uh, could do at your highest performing level that is sustained. All right. So now that we've talked about that, let's dig into it. Um, And again, 
Talking about uh, the pressure to perform, it can have positive or negative connotations. But the first thing is, is what I would have you do is when you're not under pressure, when you when you don't have uh, a deadline, a heavy weight, emotional weight hanging over you, because um, it's hard to do what I'm going to ask you to do right now when you do have that. So when you're not doing that, get prepared. And the first thing is, is I want you to uh, start getting an understanding for your motivations, your whys, what motivates you. And I will say this, a lot of people use external factors to keep them motivated. And that is fine. Uh, but there, that is not a one size fits all. And it's kind of um, I'm going to say it's, it's kind of tied to uh, a phenomenon that uh, has uh, part, partly to do with personality. And uh, so what I'm talking about is um, your motivation. So a lot of people stay motivated when people depend on them to do so. Whether you are a business owner with employees depending on you to make sure that they can continue to keep their job and um, make you know, you making payroll to pay them, or you are part of a family where people are depending on you to pull your weight in the family so that everyone can stay afloat and succeed. Or if you are a a parent with uh, small dependent children. So those are going to be some of the biggest um, factors for motivation. But then there are all other factors that they have found out that are just as powerful, if not stronger, and it is okay to use them to get done what you need to. So even if you have these factors that I just mentioned about people depending on you, there are other factors that can help you to get focused and find your concentration as well. And those are the are, are more of the internalized factors of this. Showing people they were wrong, proving people wrong. So when someone says, you know, well, you can't do this, or someone tries to take something from you, or someone embarrasses you, or someone treats you, or tries to talk to you out of station, meaning that they are trying to lord over you, this is a huge motivator to get people to do what they've not been able to do before. And so if you can figure out by going back and reviewing all the times you made a deadline, all the times you were able to finally focus and do something, if you can go back and as objectively as possible, look and see what was really the true, the true motivation that got it done or what was the true reward that got it done? That's a better indicator of being able to find what your true focus and concentration ability is. Because it's something when you can truly look at things and say, I really did this for my kids. Or you can look at it and say, I really did this just so I could shut you the heck up. And, you know, and my kids benefited, <laughs> but it helps. And the reason why it helps us is because it helps us to get clear. So with these motivations, think of them as your whys and understand that if you look at them and they feel good, but they don't really move you, that's not a good enough motivation. You see, your motivation has to be a has to be powerful enough for it to override your tendency to flee when there is high stress, your tendency to shut down when there are too many in- inputs and overwhelm, your tendency to retreat when the opposing force is way stronger than you, and on and on. So you have to have a why that's extremely powerful enough. And then this is the part that I used to get confused for a long time. So remember I said um, there are some times when you can use negative pressure to perform. And if you have a deadline, you usually wait till the last minute and then you have nowhere else to go. So you have to go forward. Yeah, that used to be one of mine that I would use all the time until it started failing me. And so I had to learn that with this motivation, If my why wasn't strong enough, then the high stakes for loss would would wouldn't be able to negate um, what why I was doing it. I would take the L and not even realize I was self sabotaging because the reason why I was doing it wasn't powerful enough for me to not take the L. And so, don't make the mistake of focusing on what happens if you fail without coupling it with a big enough why you want to succeed. 
This why needs to be powerful. And I'm giving you guys a shortcut here. That research has shown over and over again that even though people might say, I'm doing it for my kids, I'm doing it for my family, I'm doing it so I can save my life, I'm doing it so I can live. Mm -mm. Sometimes just borrow this one and say, I'm doing it so I can thumb my nose at you. I'm doing this so I can show you um, that you were wrong. I'm doing this so that I can win. Those, they, they, like I said, they might not be cute, but they will help you concentrate and um, just try it and see. So, but make sure that you kind of start working on this. If you have the ability to work on this before you need it, it's probably really good to have this all sorted out so that when it comes time for you to focus and buckle in and do stuff, then you're able to do it. Okay. All right. The next one is what is your goal? Now, in that question is the answer, the what? Too many times our goals can be convoluted. Our goals can be too complex and our goals can be too many at one time. One of the best things you can do for yourself is to focus on one goal that you can achieve. Now, this might sound trite, it might sound common, but it doesn't mean it's not wisdom. Focus on one freaking thing at a time. Build up. You cannot expect yourself to always go up to the bat and hit a perfect home run every time. Sometimes you've got to you've got to hit a base run. Sometimes you've got to bunt. I don't know why I'm using baseball. I am not proficient in that, but you get the gist of uh, my examples and metaphors. So understand that you cannot put the pressure on yourself to be perfect, to get everything done in one swing. Break that thing down to the point where it doesn't get convoluted. And I have actually found that finding my focus a lot of times can be as simple as finding that one thing. We're going to talk about that. That one thing that matters enough that once I've gotten it over and done with, I'm free emotionally and psychically to move forward. Sometimes, and I'll tell you, sometimes for me, it's picking up the phone and calling to get some more information, having to talk with someone. I am truly a child of the internet. I love being able to just get on there, finding what I need and or whatever. And just yesterday, I actually had to get out, go talk to someone and go um, meet with them to get things done. And because I was able to do that, um, I freed up so much mental bandwidth to be able to work and get things done that I was like, wow, I felt like, you know, when you get your um, everything flushed out and, and all of that and, and you're like, wow, I'm so I'm, I'm so open. I'm so free. <laughs> That's how it feels. And so with these goals, these are your what's. Why are you, you, you your motivation is going to be why your goal is going to be what? But you have to get clear on what is that thing that you need to be doing right now? That's one of the best things I can tell you that focus is not necessarily a willpower to ignore everything. Focus and concentration are dependent on how clear of a path you make. If it's if it means, and they've told people this over and over again, I'm gonna get the memo one day, but they've told people that if you can't focus, do obvious things like clean up the space that you see. Um, for a lot of people, what your mind your eyes are taking in peripherally are is still taking away from your ability to focus. So if you are in a crowded space, if if everything in front of you is busy and there's no clarity, there's no uh, area where your where you your eyes can land where there's just a blank, you know, clear canvas then that might be a problem. And I'm giving you these obvious ones, you know, so that if you you know, just looking at these can help or, or not being reminded of these as a reference point might be able to help you. You know, so like for some people, just find a space where you can make it a blank canvas. And when you go in there or and you sit down and you work, there's nothing that can catch, you know, your attention, even if it's something that has always been there. Psychically, some people need that clean canvas space so that they can gather all of their mental processing power to do what they need to. So with your goal, it's your what, you want to get clear, you don't want anything to be convoluted, and you want to find and know the best path to get started. And that best path is, um, for some people, it's going to be getting very uh, clear and um, focused by 
clearing out your space, cleaning up, tidying it up. For some people, it's going to be finding that one little thing that has been energetically nagging you that, and, and you can usually tell what it is. If it's something you dread, you know, if it's something that when you think about it, you're like, mm, I don't want to think about that right now. <laughs> if it's something that's tedium, it's tedious, it's not hard, it's just bothersome. That might be a way to get started. Okay. So then we want to look. So this is after. So finding your focus and concentration, we want to start by looking at what are your positive and negative pressures to perform. We want to look at your motivations. Those are going to be your whys. We're going to look at your goals. That's your what, how to get clear and um, um, not confused, not convoluted. Finding that one thing that you can start on that's going to be the best path to get you going. And then we're going to look at possible disasters that can come up. And when I talk about possible disasters, these are going to be little trip ups designed to get you off track. And they are not brilliant. Uh, A lot of times they will be the same things that happen over and over again. It's going to be, I've talked to people who, who absolutely know what the little disasters are. They are like, I know my kids are going to want to do X, Y, or Z, or I know that someone is going to call me and I'm going to feel guilty for ignoring, you know, the phone call or, and they, like I said, they can just go down the list and it just really, I don't want to use that word just because it's not that easy. It comes down to being able to mitigate and manage and lessen the occurrence of the little known disasters uh, before you go into your cave, your uh, your cone, your um, solitude chamber to do what it is you need to do. Have conversations. It's hard to try to uh, negotiate with children, and I totally get that. Um, but as best you can, maybe you know, work, work around their schedules when they're at school or, you know, before they get up in the mornings and, and, and the like, but, you know, try to find how to address those little disasters that are going to come uh, before they happen. And that way, when the others that you didn't plan for happen, you won't be so frazzled. All right. So here's the next one. We've already alluded to it, but it's understanding what are the high stakes? What are the stakes that are um, here? What happens if you don't succeed. And the reason why I want to ask you this is because this is, unche- if, you un- if you don't go and, and realize what's really at stake, if you don't go there and you don't know uh, what the boogeyman's outline at least looks like, the boogeyman of what's at stake will work on you in those negative pressures to perform to the point where you're overwhelmed and you and you can't succeed. The pressure becomes and the weight of it becomes too high. And so I am of that camp that is um, about facing and and getting um, a pretty good understanding of what's hiding and lurking in the dark. What's at stake if you don't succeed? What's at stake for others if you don't succeed and show up and perform? Uh, For some people, the motivation can happen just so that they don't feel ostracized for having failed others. And like I said, we're going to be talking about some personality typing in a little bit that will explain a little bit more about this. But whatever it is, be willing to go there. It Too many times people try to use uh, positive thinking to the point of toxicity where they're like, I'm not going to think about that. And they don't understand that by not at least getting a outline of what happens if you don't succeed, you are lessening your chances for doing just that. You have to understand that for every left, there's a right, every up, there's a down and so on and so forth. There are always two sides of the coin. There is a winning side. There is a losing side. And you do you you plot your peril when you ignore the other side. OK, and I will tell you, people who have a high track record of success are people that will tell you, I do not ignore the chances of failure. I I am aware of both and I choose to give the most energy to the one that is uh, the one for me to succeed. And that also comes into, so when we're talking about these um, high stakes for success, uh, you know, that what happens if you don't succeed, w- w- you know, what, what goes wrong? This is also where you need to be aware of um, a healthy respect for what's what you're up against. This is where you get well rounded enough to understand the gravity of the situation, understand that 
there are times when you need to know that there is, it's okay to have some fear and yet you still move. You see, with fo- focus and concentration, they've gotten a bad rap because they've tried to make people think that you can't have all of these emotions happening and still get into focus and concentration. You can be you can be as fearful as the next person uh, and still focus and concentrate. You can be aware of the looming boogeyman as much as the next person. It does not require to be focused and concentrated. It does not require you to be superhuman. It does not require you to be a sociopath where you can't feel anything. It doesn't require you to have any kind of supernatural ability to ignore emotions. Instead, When you are looking at finding your focus and your concentration, you are giving yourself the best opportunity to use the most emotional, physical, and mental bandwidth to help you get things done while still knowing everything else that's out there, okay? So looking a little bit more at this consequence for failure, I want to say this part, and that is do not get into uh, one side or the other. So on one side where you have this toxic uh, positivity, where you totally ignore any dangers, any warnings, anything that would make you have a healthy appreciation for what you're going against. The other side is where you get totally fixated on and you linger on only that. And that's all you see. And then the, the threat of what can happen becomes the true enemy that gets you to be defeated before you even started. Well, I can't do that. I don't have this. And and if you find that you know you have to do some stuff and you find yourself saying, there's no way I can, and here's a big one, especially if you're saying that you can't do it in a certain time length, there's a problem because time is a construct and time will, uh, there's a Pareto's law that says the amount of time you give something to do, um, the, that you assign to something is usually the amount of time it takes. And there have been times when I've had to write an entire, a whole, you hear me, a whole novel. And I only had five days and I've done it. And so (laughs) when I look at that and when I say I've done it, it's not where it's like totally perfect, but meaning it was ready to go to the, to the editor. I I got it out of my head, um, you know, um, but just understanding that, Be careful of how you look at the high stakes because you have to walk a fine tightrope between success and failure. You got to walk straight down the middle. Don't be too too much of a a bubble head and and ignore the real uh, threats and dangers. But then also don't be um, shaggy and Scooby-Doo always fretting at every ghost and shadow that you see where you can't get anything done and you're shaking in your boots. All right. So the next thing is, is let's talk about these good old, not good old, but these bad old obstacles. Okay. One of the best things I can say for when you're trying to find your focus and concentration is to quickly learn what your obstacles look like. Uh, When you learn to identify them, you get to the point where you don't confuse your obstacles with denials of progress or short uh, shutdowns. Uh, Too many times people start to get into that point of focus and concentration only to be snatched out of it because they think that they have hit something that says it's time to stop. Whether it is the phone is ringing or you get a notification on your phone or you feel like, okay, I got to go to the bathroom. But when you go to the bathroom, you're not training your mind to come right back to your task. And so you get waylaid by something you see on TV, a piece of mail on the on the counter um, between you and and where uh, the bathroom, you and where you were going. And you have to rule your mind to understand that op- there's a reason why they call obstacles opportunities because obstacles can become opportunities for you to grow and get better at what you do. They are simply little challenges along the way to power boost you up. And I have had to face obstacles that I thought were denials of service only to find out they really were obstacles. And the gift of obstacles is that they strengthen your ability to problem solve. And there is a lot to be said about them. And most people um, will understand this, that when you're trying to find your focus and your concentration, if you look at an obstacle as just an opportunity to create new pathways of neural activity to come up with a new way to solve a problem, 
you're going to be amazed at how you start to find your focus and concentration to do exactly that. All right. And so then um, tension. Now, tension is something that people don't normally consider, but tension is that opposing force, that, that consistent opposing force that's there to cause you discomfort. Whether it be people's places, things, instances, uh, arbitrary deadlines, rules, laws, penalties, monies, whatever. Those are going to be tensions. And the best thing you can do is to identify them and quarantine as many of them as possible that you don't need to address at that time. Because if you are able to suspend your interaction with unnecessary tension loads, you're going to be able to uh, focus and you're going to be able to address them because you will have gotten done with what you need. Now, I am I hate to say this, but I'm going to have to rush through uh, some of the shortcuts to getting to uh, focus and concentration because our time is really going fast. OK, so here we go. All right, so here are some shortcuts to help you to start finding your particular focus and concentration areas. Like I said before, the first one is to find that one big thing that matters. And when I say the one big thing that matters, I'm not talking about the overall one big thing. I'm talking about the one thing that if you address it, it allows you to focus and concentrate. It's that one barrier that if you address it, it makes, uh, and when it's removed, it you don't have to uh, worry about all of that energy that you were using, considering it to still be at play. So for some people, uh, well, actually, I'll say this. I have a acquaintance that when they have to go and write, um, they have to do their laundry. For some reason, their laundry, if, they, if there's dirty laundry, they can't focus. And they didn't find that out until they realized that that's their linchpin. So they'll do their laundry and put it up and, you know, everything else is tidy. And then when they sit down, they are able to write. They're able to show up and be committed to the bit. All right. And like I said, yours is going to be different from mine. And that's why it's part of finding the pathway to your specific focus and concentration. All right. So here is the next one. Lock in on the direction of your best future. Now, this is real important. If you don't get any of the other ones that I'm about to fly through, get this one. Lock in on what direction you feel like your best future is in and go in that direction. That's going to help you to pick your best motivation. It's going to help you to get clear on your goal of what it is you want. It's going to help you to identify all the stakes, the um, obstacles, and the failures that lie ahead on that path so that you can get as prepared as possible. And it's going to help you to succeed. Excuse me. People tend to succeed when they have a future point in mind. Okay. So the next one is know uh, your why with clarity. All right. And so knowing your why with clarity is going right back to that motivation that we talked about. And then here's another one. Start small and grow. <clears throat> Excuse me, you guys. Start small and grow. And don't don't try to hit the home run when you go up to the bat uh, to um to bat every time. Small start with something that you can gain a quick win with, okay? And then this is one that I tend to struggle with, and that is to give yourself enough time to practice, but not too much time to fizzle out. There comes a time when you got to realize, am I slow or am I just padding my time when I could have gotten this done? Uh, and it's not anything to do with procrastination as much as it is to do with understanding how effective and um, productive you really are. If you notice that you're giving yourself too much time, be careful of that because idle mind really is a devil's workshop and you will find yourself having more opportunity to get distracted, get sidelined and waylaid. So make it tight, keep it tight. Only give yourself enough time to be focused to do what it is you need to do. The next one is, is like I said, don't fixate on toxic positivity. Don't fixate on everything is great. Everything is per per uh, um, perfect. Everything always works out. No, be aware that you might be walking through hell on a cobweb and you need to hurry up. All right. And so the next one is don't trade what you want the most for what you can get at the moment. Be aware of the fact that you are in it for the long haul. Whatever your goal is, be clear on that and focus on that. Don't give up for some um, uh, 
lesser substitute because you will not, you're training yourself to not concentrate and fo- on focus. Every time you allow yourself to get away with something, you weaken your resolve to focus and concentrate. So stay true to what your goal is. Keep plugging along. Yes, you'll get some victories. Enjoy the victory for a minute, but get right back up and get going until you have finished what it is you're supposed to do because you're training yourself to obey the power of your intentions and your words. And then this next one has to do with tendencies. Yes, there are four basic kind of tendency personality types. Uh, Ruben Gretsch, um, uh, Gretchen Rubin has a book called The Four, Four Personality Tendencies. Great book. And she says that the majority of the population are what we would call obligers. And so when I was talking about your motivation, meaning that you do things because others are depending on you, that means that if you're in the general population, that's going to be a great way for you to be motivated. But if you are like about 25% of the population who questions or who is uh, a rebellious person, that's not going to work for you. You're going to be more motivated by showing people that they are wrong about you. And so it's okay to use those motivators. And then the last thing as my time is really up, y'all, is to figure out what is your rhythm and flow and find it. Once you find it, stay in it. From a baby to the grave, you have a specific rhythm, a circadian rhythm, a flow of how you need to work. And so a lot of people will start by looking at what sensually motivates and pacifies them, whether it be music or um, lighting or scents in your atmosphere. Figure out what it is that keeps you calm, keeps you in the zone and allows you to do what it is you need to do and then lock in on it and use it. And so guess what, y'all? Yep, my time is up. I thank you for yours. This has been Michelle Spiva, your Practical Priestess of Wisdom with another podcast of Wisdom Smack. Don't forget to check the show notes, like, subscribe, share, comment, give me feedback and let me know what you want us to talk about. And I'm going to see you tomorrow. And that's going to do it for today's podcast of Wisdom Smack with Michelle Spiva. If you like this podcast, please help us get the word out. Like, comment, subscribe, and even share. And if you really like it, please help us continue to get the word out by considering using this show's link for Amazon. So when you want to go to Amazon and you do all of your general shopping, Uh, please use michellespiva.com forward slash AMZ. It's simple as that. It doesn't cost you anything extra. And this show might receive a little bit of commission that will go towards helping to further get these episodes out to you and to others. So thank you so much for listening. This has been Michelle Spiva with Wisdom Smack. Bye.